I feel really strongly that if someone wants to be a teacher in this profession, that the priorities need to be the kids and the music in that order. And of course, the music is, you know, that's the key. That's the motivator. That's that's what we live for. But, you know, I, it, it can't be at the expense of the kids. And um, sometimes I, I think that that may get in the way a little bit. And, and the other thing is that no matter how old we are, or how many years we've been teaching, I think it's really important to become to be a lifelong learner. There's not a day that goes by that I don't try to, I mean, I although I'm not conducting uh, it, anything but, you know, honor bands or, or going to colleges and doing some of their, their work there. But I still am learning new pieces because there's so much great music out there. But my last most favorite piece uh, was the Gandalfi, Ancient Airs and Dances. It is a magnificent piece. And, uh, you know, or I'll go back and look at the Hindemith, and I've never done that piece that I haven't discovered something that I didn't notice before. So, you know, it, it's, if I were to offer advice to a beginning teacher or somebody who's been teaching for 50 years, it's that as long as you're learning, it's never going to get old. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio-on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Jake Walker and Colin Peters for their contributions to the show, and especially to all of you who are listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, Paula Kreider. Hi, Paula. How are you? Doing well. So, Paula, I don't know if you need any introduction for my listeners, but would you introduce yourself for them? Uh, my name is Paula Kreider. I am a retired professor from the University of Texas, and I now serve as a senior educational consultant for Con Selmer Steinway. Excellent. Paula, I am just honored to have you on the show. You are certainly one of the legendary names in our field and our profession and, and a trendsetter and pioneer for women conductors. And I'm really just tickled that you're on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, okay. So, Paula, I always start each of these interviews with trying to get the origin story of my guests. How did you get into music as a child? And uh, what were those early years like? Well, um, my mother said that uh, I couldn't be her child. I sprang forth from beneath the rock. So that's my uh, creation story. Um, I started band very late. I was uh, into sports in high school and uh, my sophomore year our basketball team and did very very well and then coaches uh, as they are wont to do in public schools our really great coach became a principal the new coach uh, did not wasn't really interested in coaching girls at all he had to coach both girls and boys so he would sit in his office and smoke a cigarette and drink coffee and read the paper when we were supposed to be practicing and so I was nominated to go talk to him, and I said, Coach, we really need you out there. And he said, well, no. He said, uh, why don't you just go coach him, which did not go over very well. And I was, I know this will come as a surprise, but I was a bit of a hothead. So I went and got my uniform, my shoes, and went in and threw them on his desk and quit the team and went storming up these stairs at the top of the gym, and the door opened, and a man was standing there with a trumpet in his hand. And he put the trumpet in my hand and he said, blow in the small end. This is, I, you can't make this up. This is really true. 
And it, as it turned out, of course, he was expecting someone else. But I made probably the worst sound known to man as a beginning trumpet player. But I can still remember how making that sound made me feel. My whole body was alive with that sound. And I joined the band the next day. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I, I was so far behind in my musical education that I didn't even think about becoming a band director. I just wanted to play my horn. And when I got to college, uh, I began to practice lots and I was majoring in English and minoring in physics. And one day, uh, someone who became very special in my life, Bill Moody, who was a band director at the University of Southern Mississippi, walked by. I was learning how to restring a French horn. I, that was fascinating me for some reason. He said, you know, you're not going to be happy if you're not a band director. And it was, you know, I, it was like, oh, do you really think I can? So I didn't drop my other majors, but I did add a music major. And by that time, I decided that I was going to, you know, keep on practicing and become the next Marie Speciale. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was the very first female trumpet player to ever play in a major symphony. And Bill Moody encouraged all of us, of course, to get an ed degree, and wisely so. So I did my student teaching, and on the, I think it was the seventh or eighth day of my student teaching, the supervising teacher had a band, had a heart attack. And it wasn't that serious. Well, all heart attacks are serious, but, you know, it, but it wasn't debilitating. But he decided that he, he was very close to retirement, that he was just going to go ahead and retire. His exact words were, I'm not going to die on this expletive deleted marching field. <laughs> so the principal called me in and said, you know, would you, we'll pay you to be a substitute teacher until we get somebody to take the job. And I was young and foolish and thought, hey, I'll get paid to substitute until I stood in front of the band and realized there wasn't anybody to tell me how to teach and what to do. The band program was uh, not strong. That's being polite. And, uh, you know, second week in September, they couldn't find anybody to take the job. So I became an instant band director after seven days of student teaching. <laughs> and, you know, it was good that the, well, it wasn't good that it wasn't a strong band, but for if it had been a strong band program, I would have totally failed because I really you know, had no experience whatsoever. But I called my friends who had been teaching for two or three years every night and said, what do you do about this? What do you do about this? And stayed about one step ahead of the kids. And it was my goal in life. They never made a one at state contest. And that was my, my first goal in life. And I'm embarrassed to say that now, but I felt that I had to prove myself. And uh, the first year we went to contest. And this is something that was a real pivotal experience in my life. Uh, we had worked and worked and worked on the tunes. I played two pieces by the same composer, Frank Erickson. Should have known better. One of them was Air for Band, which I still think is a great piece. And guess who was one of the judges at the state band contest? Frank Erickson. And I was petrified. <laughs> so, but he wrote... And, and we did. We made the first straight ones that the band had ever made. We had a parade in the fire department when we came home. But I sat down and read his comment sheet, and I, I had it on the wall of my office framed in every place I ever taught. He said, your band plays well. They get good sounds. They play in tune. The style is good. You've paid attention to balance and yada, yada, yada. But at the end, it went dot, dot, dot. But what about the music? Boom. And I realized as a very young teacher, that I would spend so much time making sure that they couldn't find anything wrong with the music, that there was very little music there at all. So after that year, I, I made it and have always made it one of my first priorities to be sure that I'm treating that unwieldy instrument on the other side of the baton and playing that instrument even more musically than I could ever play my trumpet. So I stayed there for two years, great kids. Uh, the program was really headed in the right direction. And then I realized that I really need to further my education. So I came out to the University of Texas. Bill Moody had moved out to become the director of bands out here. So uh, I got a teaching assistantship, but he decided that uh, uh, perhaps I might want to talk to the music supervisor because he was looking for somebody to teach a middle school band on the east side of Austin, which is would, would be now what would be a, a Title I school. 
It was 59%, uh, 49% African-American, 50% Hispanic, and there was one Anglo child in the band. His father was the director of the Salvation Army Band. I discovered that quite quickly when I told the kids they sounded like the Salvation Army Band on a cold winter's night. I got a phone call that night from Dad, and uh, he became a good friend and supporter. But uh, at any rate, these kids had not been taught. They didn't even, I had the first day, I said, let's start with a B-flat concert scale. And they didn't know what I was talking about. I had no knowledge of the cultures whatsoever. I didn't know how to pronounce Hispanic names. And it was one of the best teaching experiences I ever had. Because I had to learn so many ways to say things to reach those kids. And once they realized that I cared about them, man, I couldn't run them out of the band hall. So I was able to work on my master's and, and on my doctorate while I was teaching. And Again, it was a very weak band program, and by the second year, they were making all first divisions, and the music supervisor, his name was Weldon Covington, and I really owe my career to him because his wife was a, a fantastic middle school band director, and, and Mr. Cobb, as we called him, really would like to have seen her take a high school band, but those were the days when women just didn't get to do that. Notice I say get to do that, and um, Crockett High School came open. It was a 4A high school, which was the largest size high class high school at the time. And he gave me the opportunity to take that job. And uh, it was, you know, looking back on it, he took a real chance because if I had failed, he never would have heard the end of it. Yeah. Um, it, was a, it was a good band program. The kids were great. And I stayed there for 12 years and, uh, you know, started a tradition of which I was very proud. We you know, did all the things that a band supposed to do. We had more kids in the Allstate band a couple of years than anyone else and so on and so forth. But those weren't the markers that really mattered. It was, you know, I still see kids that smile when they talk about pieces that we played. After 12 years, I went to the University of Texas first uh, as the assistant director and uh, then became the director of the Longhorn Band and a fully tenured professor in the music department. Stayed there for 17 years, had a great time working in a major university. And when I retired, um, I had no idea that other doors would open, but the ability, you know, the opportunity to work with Tim Lassenheiser and Con Selmer in the Department of Education has been wonderful. I've been able to travel all over the world, work with band directors and work with kids. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have retired if I didn't know I could still wave the little white stick. So, you know, there, therein is the PC career. <laughs> yeah, I have a lots, lots of questions, of course, <laughs> from that, <laughs> and I, I'm really looking forward to this. So, the first thing that you said that struck me, and I, and I love the basketball story because I think you know I, I was a, a child of the '70s and the early '80s, and I think I was at the very tail end of that coach smoking the cigarette in the office <laughs> culture. Yeah. <laughs> So that sort of resonated with me, but, um, more importantly, you mentioned that you came to band late and, um, one of the things in that, you know, I don't want to like stir a hornet's nest or poke the hornet's nest as it were. But one of the things that I con I'm concerned about is that very often the doors to being in the band aren't open to kids after a certain age, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm just curious as if as how you feel how that worked for you and maybe if there's anything we can think about our current situation to kind of let kids come late to the game. You know, and it, of course it depends on the situation and scheduling, but I was really lucky when I taught at Crockett that, uh, you know, we had a fourth band mm -hmm. after a while. We only had two bands when I got there, but that fourth band was open to everyone and kids would go out and recruit for me. Oh, Okay. And and it was, you know, it was a beginner situation for most of the kids, but it was the most my assistant and I used to just fight to who got to conduct the band that day. I always I, I've always felt it's important that the head director not turn over any band totally to anyone else, because I don't I never wanted my kids to feel like they were second class citizens if they weren't in the top band. Right. But that fourth band was, and it was so much fun. And as you know, sometimes kids can come late and just blossom. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just have to have their, and, and some kids were there just because they wanted to be there with their friends and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But, but I think that 
that being inclusive instead of exclusive makes for a much stronger band program. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think back to my history. I don't know if I've ever said this on the show, but I never play. I didn't play for a, a year and a half of middle school because of a family move. And mm. I was a fish out of water and I didn't come back to it till my freshman year of high school. And so I was that close to not having a career in music. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah. um, you know, I managed to kind of catch up and, you know, here I sit, but, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I really think about those kids, you know, when I'm teaching, I teach fourth through eighth grade now after college for a long time, but, um, you know, most of my kids are beginners and they come at all ages. I mean, across that spectrum. So, you know, I'm always trying to like be open to them, but anyway. Well, you know, and I love teaching beginners until my program got too big at Crockett. I would always teach at least one class of beginners at one of the, the, elementary schools because kids at that age as you know if you tell them to stand on their heads and eat green peanut butter they'll ask you how to stand on your head and where do you get green peanut butter you know they're, they're, and if you can start them right as you know it makes all the difference in the world you know in my job teaching fourth graders I, I had never taught that young and I had just come from teaching college so my first year and really my first three years have been kind of like learning on the fly because I had forgotten so much of the stuff <laughs> that oh, I was yeah. supposed to teach them. Yeah. And, um, and you mentioned being in an unfamiliar situation in your job where you had the, the title one school. And so I'm really thinking about that as far as when you put yourself into an unfamiliar situation, you're forced to grow and sort of the benefits of that. You know, I do think that's the way we grow. And that's that's the reason that I finally made a decision to leave high school and go to college, because I really didn't want to leave. Everything was working so well after 12 years. But, you know, I, I learned, especially with those kids, that how important it is to hear them and to listen to them and and how important it was. As I say, it was a big deal for me to learn how to pronounce Hispanic names correctly. Mm-hmm. And, and many of the teachers, frankly, at the school didn't even bother to do that. That's a shame. You know, but, but that, that mattered to, of course it mattered to the kids. It matters to anyone. And, uh, you know, the, one of the funniest things that happened was, <laughs> this is kind of an aside, but they wanted to get me a gift at the spring concert the first year. And so they came up with a sack from one of our, our department stores and it had Kind of that was back in the days when you, you probably don't even know what a moo moo is, but it's this like sack like looking thing with flowers on it, something that I would never wear. And uh, there were three different sizes, <laughs> so I you know held one up and wore it to school the next day. And and I started thinking out why did they get three and why this? And I found out that they'd collected money. They wanted to get me a plaque. And the kid that he collected the money had it in his locker and it was stolen. So they went to the department store and looking for something and didn't know what size I wore. So they shoplifted. Bought you a moo moo. Three dresses. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm thinking, how can I handle this? The kids really, you know, so we talked and we, we went back to the department store and gave two of them back. And then, you know, I pay. I was going to pay from one of them, and the guy said, "Oh no, 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 no! The kids really care about you, and so forth." But you know that I still have that moo moo. I'll never wear it again. Oh, you should but, wear it with Julie Giroux sometime with when she has hers on. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. We could be twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you know, and those kids—they're—they're they're so special, and and you know that age they say some of the funniest oh, things they, do. they sure do know it. I'm sure you know that yeah they're, they're it's really they're really visceral and that um that sometimes can be bad of course as we know but yeah. for, for the most part it's really positive you come out feeling like you've accomplished something often when i was teaching freshman college students in theory they they didn't leave happy <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh yeah much different energy I'll say. And I admire you for teaching theory. I don't think I have the patience to ever grade theory papers. <laughs> well, that was the worst part of the gig, for sure. That's what I hear. Yeah, yeah. it's just endless. It just never really stops. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, you know, you mentioned that you were at the University of Mississippi and you're an English major. One of the questions I usually ask people is when they knew they wanted to be a band director. But it sounds like, again, that came late there as well. 
it did. I knew that I wanted to play my horn for the rest of my life. And I was already thinking, well, maybe I can play in a youth, you know, I mean, a, a community band or something. But it, it wasn't until, the, as I say, Dr. Moody walked by and said, you're not going to be happy if you're not a band director. And then, of course, I went and talked to him and said, you know, do you really think I could? And and he said, of course you can, which which was rare then, too, because, again, females were not being encouraged to be band directors. The school itself, you know, general music was kind of the track if you were a, a, a good musician that, you know, you could do that and, you know. Teach private lessons. Teach. That was sort yeah, of like, yeah. 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 Which is, you know, if that's what people want to do, that's great. But that certainly wasn't what I wanted to do because my high school band was not a very good high school band. And yet my high school band director was a fantastic musician. He was a violinist. And at the age of 16, he played second violin in the NBC Symphony Orchestra under Toscanini. So he had the musical chops. He taught us solfege. I thought when I got to, when I finally changed to a music major, I thought everybody knew how to do that. And, and he used to play his violin every day. And we all we played were transcriptions, which, you know, <laughs> we were playing great music. So, you know, I, I got I instinctively absorbed a lot of music before I ever got to college, which was great. But, you know, the sounds probably weren't wonderful because he didn't know how to teach wind instruments. Yeah. I, I still teach, I teach soulfish to the kids because early on I realized I got tired of saying three different notes in a heterogeneous class. Exactly. You know, I didn't want to have to do the trans, I mean, the transpositions are hard, but you know, you don't yeah. want to do it all the time. Right. So That's the way I taught my beginners. And you know, you teach them to sing, hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Play dough. They all know it's concert B flat. I don't have to like start transposing everybody. You're exactly. C, you're B flat. You know? <laughs> right. So all that stuff goes away quickly with Soulfish. Yeah, good on you. Yeah, and then they start to read, and then it's not an issue anymore. But that comes later, as we know. It's it's mm -hmm. all about. So you switched to music as a major, and you did a triple major while at Southern Mississippi. How was that as far as kind of getting through that music degree starting late? Were you able to kind of manage that course load? Yeah, because I, I just jumped in in the summertime. Oh, uh, okay caught up with a whole lot. And it wasn't really, I, my physics was a minor. I bet I had an English lit major mm -hmm. I graduated with. But the, um, you know, you could take, actually, um, I took form and analysis before I took second year theory mm -hmm. um, because it was offered in the summer and the teacher was a bear and he didn't know I hadn't taken second year theory. And oh. the first day he said, if you didn't make an A in second year theory, because this was an accelerated course in the summer. He said, you won't pass my course. And all my friends were kind of looking at me. It's like, dear God, don't tell him. And I just, I mean, I sweated bullets and just worked and worked and worked and made an A in the class. And when he found out from one of the little stinkers that <laughs> ratted on me at the end of the semester, uh, he called me in the office and, and told me that I he wasn't going to give me credit for the class. Really? Because he yeah, he felt I'd made him look foolish. And uh, so I had to go to the dean and kind of plead my case and say, look, I made an A in the class. Come on. And and uh, I avoided that teacher in the halls for the rest of my music career. Yeah. Fortunately, that kind of self-importance is, is exiting academia. Yes. And, you know, with that exception, I had some of the most wonderful teachers. And he was a great teacher. He just. Uh, he didn't like that. That that happened. No, there was a little ego involved, I think. All right. Let's talk about your, your anecdote, because I can't imagine seven days as a student teacher. And then <laughs> <laughs> it might have been eight. It's, I can't quite remember how long it took him. So what was the reaction of the kids? Because you you weren't very old yourself at that point. No, no, I was. I As a matter of fact, I turned 21 uh, in that September. Um they they were so supportive because the band director was um, had been there for a number of years. And, um, you know, sometimes people get to a point where they're not really happy with teaching anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since that. Yeah. And, and so, you know, even though I didn't really know what I was doing, at least I was young and enthusiastic. <laughs> and, and, you know, so that really won the kids over. And and uh, I can remember I had a French horn player who was also 
the next year was valedictorian, just really smart kid. And she became my drum major. But after about a month, she came and she said, I'm going to quit band. Well, she was my only French horn player. And, you know, when a kid says, I'm going to quit band, those are like the worst words you can hear. And it was like, well, please come in the office and let's talk about it and just why do you want to quit band? And she said, because you expect me to be accurate on the French horn. And I, I just can't, I just can't hit the pitches like you want me to. And I said, well, you know, so she brings her horn in and sat down and started playing. And I realized that she was playing on a B flat horn, but had a single horn and had learned F fingerings in her beginner book. She could lip like crazy. So when we, so the first thing I did was go back to a friend who had an old French where we got a double horn and we, you know, the, and she became obviously a you know a much more accomplished <laughs> player. But you know, if when you, it's hard to look at a horn and tell if it's a B flat or an F horn if it's a horn. And that child had been doing playing on that since sixth grade. Yeah, so, unless you try it out yourself, you don't really know. Yeah, and that's what I had to do. And it's like, no, 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 wait a minute, and. And I ran into that a lot, but again, what an education for me, because I'd say, okay, he's getting a really funky sound. Let me see if I can duplicate that. What in the world? Are you? Oh, you're not tonguing. You know, so it was, and the kids got better fast because kids want to get better if you hold their feet to the fire and, you know, if they know you care about them. Yeah. It's one of the challenges that this year with COVID beginning band teachers, especially because you can't see their embouchure through a screen and you know you can't, can't see if they're know. you know they're anchor tonguing and all the little things that you know come from seeing them sure and and you know one of the worst things that can happen is when they develop those habits and you have to change them if they're wrong yeah it's hard it's really difficult yeah. you know and even if, even if you're there every day they still can develop the habits because they're stubborn they're people like us <laughs> oh absolutely and, and they, but, they, you know, they that's one thing about COVID is, is I travel around the country virtually. I have seen more dedication this year and more innovation mm -hmm. and teachers are killing themselves to keep music in the lives of their students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it just, you know, it just, sometimes I'll weep at the beauty of that dedication because it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's something. It was, um, it was quite a rude awakening when I was told that I couldn't have band. <laughs> oh my gosh. But that I'm sure. going to be able to keep my job and teach them something else. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. But yeah. did you start beginners this year? I did not start beginners and I kept my middle schoolers going till October and then the cases started to spike in the area. Mm. And then they pulled the plug on that too. And we've been doing um we did some bucket drumming and then we did um I get them on the free software on the computer it's called soundtrap and so oh, they've yay. been they've been creating songs and they've been doing film scores and podcasts and cool so, you know all that's i can do is try to keep them engaged be a music teacher you know and that's something i think that one of the many things that's going to come out of this is really positive is it all of us have forced to be a lot more imaginative and innovative than we ever would have yeah before. Sometimes I think we get a little bit too entrenched as band directors and forget the music teacher part of it. Here, here. And, you know, a, a lot of people have said to me, they realize now how competition focused they were and how that was not the healthiest thing for their program. So I, I think, you know, good things can come out of challenges. And this has given us a chance to entirely rebuild what we do. If something was wrong, we get a chance to, to do over, which you usually can't do on the fly. That's a good point. You yeah. bet. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having kids with instruments again, though, in the, in the fall. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to standing from a live ensemble. I did two virtual Allstate bands Oof. this year. That was the craziest thing I've ever done. But yeah, at I least imagine. the kids... Got to audition for Allstate and, you know, had that activity, but yeah, huh. yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's something. So you mentioned, um, the, one of the worst things that you can hear as a band director is when a kid says they want to quit. One of the mm -hmm. things that I've sort of learned over the years is that if a kid tells you they want to quit band, you can't beg them to come back because then you're always at their, their mercy. And, um, yeah. What ways have you found over the years to, I don't know, maybe to to talk to those kids in a way that doesn't put them in the position of power and yet still makes you makes them feel wanted? Yeah, you know, I I used uh, my leadership 
and peer pressure a lot because I, I felt that was a lot more positive. And, and you know, really, I, I have never had much problem with kids quitting the band program because it was something that they wanted to be a part of. And one of the things that I think I can attribute to that success was that I had uh, when a child came into the band, they would have a big brother or a big sister assigned to them. And between middle school and high school that summer, you know, they go talk to the kids because sometimes there's a great attrition there because kids are afraid when they go to high school. They don't know what it's going to be like. And, you know, they would teach them the school song and the fight song and traditions and, and you know, take them out to get a Coke or something and, and really encourage them. And, and then when they got into the ninth grade, these these older kids would also make sure that they helped them with their you know, all state or tryout music or whatever their solos. It was, it was a good, uh, uh, you know, there was good leadership in the band. Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea because it also invests the older kids in your program. Absolutely. And they, you know, not everybody got to be a big brother or a big sister. I had to make sure they were responsible. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. That, that's a really great idea. I'm thinking about how I can do that with my, cause I have a fourth grade beginners fifth grade beginners, and then a middle school six through eight. Yeah. And so what can I do with those sixth through eighth graders? Well, the sixth and seventh graders to kind of get them involved with the younger kids. You know, depending on your schedule, but even if they're, if you know, they could probably do some of that virtually, which would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to have to talk to the middle school teachers to see what I can do. Kids are amazing. In one program that I was talking to the director, who was telling me that the kids uh, – that he was really worried because he couldn't start beginners at all, you know, same situation. And so getting ready for next year. And so his students, the seniors wanted to leave a legacy. So they asked him if they could go to all the, the uh, uh, middle school or the sixth grade, where, whatever grade they started in, talk to the principal, get a list of names and get permission to call every one of those kids and talk to them about being in band. And it was like, you know, hi, my name is Mark and I'm in the band and how are you doing? And, you know, and <laughs> it turned out to be tremendous because the kids were at least willing to go see what it was going to be like. Sure, sure. Yeah. You had a remarkable career at the University of Texas after Crockett High School. Can you talk to me about that and what it was like as a woman in a male dominated field, especially when you first probably took that job? And what that means maybe for young women who are band directors now? Well, you know, backing up to, to starting at Crockett and, and I felt that there was a tremendous, I put a lot of pressure on myself because, uh, you know, and, and it's true today. If you're a minority or if you're a female, you have to be far better than average to be considered equal. It just is. And, you know, you can whine about it or it can make you stronger. And and I, you know, it wasn't as if I felt that I was looking over my shoulder and wondering what people were thinking, because I think that's a waste of time. But I, I really felt it was necessary to build the very best program possible for the kids in the program, because when I first started teaching at Crockett, there were, there were some gentlemen that uh, I found out later um, really uh, encouraged some of the judges not to give us a first division rating because, you know, uh, I had no business taking that job away from a man. And uh, I, I didn't find that out for a number of years, and I'm glad. But the, the point is that I knew that if they weren't, they couldn't be just good. They had to be really good so that there was no doubt in anybody's mind when we went to a contest or a festival that, uh, you know, that they deserved a top rating. And so, you know, that, that, that was, but that didn't occupy my mind. It's, it's funny. I had a guy, a college student asked me once in a, on a, I was on a, uh, uh, you know, we were having an interview and he said, what does it feel like to be a female band director? And I had to laugh because I said, well, I've never been a guy. I don't have anything to compare. It. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, and they're, they're, 
I have to say that my colleagues here in Texas, the ones whom I admire and respect, were always very supportive. And, and you know, some of the like Howard Dunn, who had one of the best high school bands in, in, in Texas at Richardson High School, became a very dear friend. And uh, he went on to teach at SMU. And he was he was one of these guys when I could pick up the phone and call him and say, Howard, you know, tell me about this new piece. And, and you know, 30 minutes later, I know everything I needed to know about it. It was for me, it was a, a situation where uh, I just put my nose down and worked hard. And the same thing when I went to the university, um, I really hadn't planned on taking that job. I love what I was doing at Crockett. The kids were wonderful. The program was, I mean, it was just about running itself because the kids cared, you know, and once that leadership gets going, once they drink that Kool-Aid, um, it just kind of is self-perpetuating. And when I went to college and I was all ready for, oh, my gosh, you know, I never thought I'd be a university professor. And I remember my first faculty meeting and the voice faculty was arguing with the piano faculty. And I was sitting in the back of the hall going, I can't believe this. So, you know, it, it was uh, it was interesting. And as you know, college kids want to be treated like adults, but sometimes they act like sixth graders. So. They do. <laughs> But, you know, nonetheless, and especially during the marching band, that there we had 360 kids in the marching band. And in one year, there were over 200 who were academic, academic All-Americans. So some of the best and brightest kids and, you know, the kids in Texas play very well. So the playing ability and the marching ability of that band was quite high. And the kids, you know, they, they were just great. And, and they grew up, you know, maybe 15 percent were music majors and have done very well. But also so many kids have gone out like we had. Uh, he was not my student, but there was a tuba player years ago who uh, went into engineering and did quite well and uh, donated 18 million dollars to the Longhorn Band Scholarship Fund wow. a couple of years ago. So. You know, there, there's there's that type of kid who's bright, who loves music, but who goes out and changes the world and does well financially. And, and you know, they come back, they pay it back, which is great. Yeah, you said a couple of interesting things there. Um, one is that you had to work harder as a woman and that that was something that you were, you know, you put your nose down and just worked, you know, worked harder than everyone mm -hmm. else. And one of the, the teachers that I was blessed with having composition lessons from was Ellen Taffas Willick. Who was oh the first? Gosh. Yeah, one of the first, the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in music, and um, <laughs> yes, she was very stern. She was very kind, but very stern as well. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of got that from her. Like she, she had to always be her very best when I, you know, and I, I kind of felt that from her. And I think that um, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, but it seems like that's common among your generation, you know, that the pioneering generation who sort of broke these glass ceilings. Yeah. And I, I think it's instinctive rather than something that is, is, is planned, mm -hmm. but you know, it, and it wasn't like, I have to be better than everybody else. It's just that I, I've always been a lifelong learner and I've always wanted to find ways to do, to make something uh, more efficient or more imaginative or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, I, I think the best teachers, male, female, are, are going to always do that. They're always going to find a better way. And, and part of it, a big part of it, is motivation. You can have all the knowledge in the world if, if you can't develop what I call your teacher voice. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have any female role models. And when I first started teaching, I tried to emulate the, the male teachers. And, you know, that just doesn't work for a female. So you have to find your own, your own voice, but I think everybody does. Yeah. It doesn't work. It doesn't really work for males either. You know, I, one of the things I was, my father was a long time high school teacher. He taught for over 50 years. And, um, you know, when I first started teaching high school, he had lots of advice for me, but mm -hmm. you know, and that was one of them is you can't try to be someone else. You know, no. you're just going to have to take your lumps early on and uh, learn who you are as a teacher. And good advice. It is good advice. I think a lot of yes. young teachers need to hear that because, you know, as you know, the first couple of years are very difficult. Oh, gosh. And and that's where we lose a lot of teachers. Absolutely. And that's why I think it's so important for for people to find a mentor, find somebody that, that believes in you and that you trust enough to, you know, a, a lot of kids are hesitant to ask questions because they think it makes them look 
unintelligent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always tell my students, don't be afraid to ask questions. The smartest kids in the world are the people who are always asking questions. Well, there's something to that. What would you say? You you mentioned having a mentor. Um, Do you have any words of encouragement beyond that for young teachers who might be listening? Yeah. You know, my grandmother and both of my grandparents were really great influences on me. And and one of my my grandmother uh, actually knew Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh wow! And was a great fan of hers, and and said, you know, one of the f- famous Eleanor Roosevelt quotes is, "No one has the right to make you feel inferior without your consent." <clears throat> Excuse me. And my grandmother taught me that quote. I can remember when I was a little kid. I don't think I really understood it till I grew up a little bit more. But it's you know the. The world is so full of naysayers, and and it's so easy to be negative now. I I do not watch sitcoms. I hate them because the, the the so much of the humor is at the expense of someone else, and it's cruel. And so you know, people become masters of the put down, and you know. I really tell, especially the the young kids of today, they're going to have to save our world and save our planet. Mm-hmm. And when people talk to me about, oh, the youth of today and yada, 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 I don't believe that for a minute because the kids I'm working with right now are some of the best and the brightest that I've ever worked with. And and I just tell them not to let anybody ever tell them that they can't do what they want, whatever they want to do and be whoever they want to be. Because, you know, there are too many naysayers. Just don't listen to them. Yeah. I just watched the HBO documentary about Fred Rogers. Oh, yes. And Wasn't that something? I, it was something. And I, I kept thinking during it, boy, we need more of him right now. Mm-hmm. The belief in everybody. It's just it, there's it's just it feels like a gentler time somehow. And, you know, the the kids that were latchkey kids and parents weren't around and how he changed their lives is pretty amazing, too. Paul, do you have any experience working with composers during your time at Texas? And, and what was that like for you? Oh, my gosh. Yes. The. the I, I, I think probably the, the first person with whom I had, I found out that we had some grants. And so uh, the first person we brought to campus was Warren Benson. Mm. And he spent a week with us and talking to, of course, the theory class and the composition, but he also talked to my conducting classes. And, you know, the kids used to, the second semester conducting, one of the, my assignments, uh, you know, semester long assignment was about score study mm-hmm. because the kids, all they wanted to do was learn how to wave the hands. And, you know, there's, as we all know, there's a little more to it than that. And they would just, you know, as college kids would or want to do stand out in the halls instead of working on score study, complain about having to work on score study. But, um, and then of course they come back and thank you later. Right. And, um, and Warren came into class one morning and he, he was not a morning person. And my class was at eight o'clock in the morning. So I had coffee for him and I said, uh, you know, Professor Benson, would you would you talk to the kids about score study? We're working on one of your pieces right now. And he looked at him and he said, when you become it, if you become a teacher and you stand on the podium and sight read a piece, you should be arrested for child abuse. <laughs> and then he got up and walked out. <laughs> That was that was it. Mm-hmm. But boy, did he ever make a point, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. Michael Colgrass uh, was another composer who was just absolutely mind-bendingly wonderful, and and talked to the kid. One of the things I remember him teaching the kids was that if you want to memorize music and you tape it up to the left, there's something about you know the the way the brain is wired that it's easier to memorize music. Oh. Then he turned the lights out and had him meditate. And, and did some really crazy interesting things that that uh, really expanded, you know, the kids' worldview. Um, David Mislanka is one of my favorite composers, and we had him on campus several times. And uh, I think his Symphony Number no. Four is is just a remarkable piece of music. It is. And he was there. Jerry Junkin um, commissioned that piece. And I was a fly on the wall with my own score to see the whole genesis of that. That was really fun. And then two years later, I played it with my symphony band. Yeah, he was a remarkable man, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what kind of benefits? So if there's a listener who's considering a, maybe commissioning a composer or bringing a composer in to work with their kids, what do you think is the value of that for, for our musicians? I think that and not only for the kids, but for the director as well, to see a piece of music through the eyes of a composer is absolutely eye opening, you know, pun intended, but or ear opening, I should say. And and, you know, the, to, to let kids I, I can remember we had this guy named Rick Brown, who was a local composer, and he did a piece for us once. And I can remember the kid's eyes just like. The guy's alive, <laughs> he was, you know, because a lot of kids don't realize that. And what people are doing now, which is great, is that like uh, I did a piece, uh, a John Mackey piece with one of the Allstate bands I did. And so I called John and said, John, would you spend 30 minutes with the kids and let them ask questions? Mm -hmm. And it was just magical because of his insights and also just that human element that kids get when the composer is writing a piece for them, you know, I, I think, and, and a lot of people say, well, you know, it's too expensive. I can't afford it. Well, you know, you don't have to commission John Mackey. Right. You know, they're, they're young, hungry, hungry kids that if you call your local university and say, do you have a talented young student that might want to write for my band? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's great for both of them. So I am a, a real proponent of that. I think that's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's invaluable. There's something else you said earlier and you talked about, um, you realized you were, you were focusing on details when you were a high school director, but it was mm -hmm. really about the music. It's interesting because I, when I first took my first high school job, I, I really was unprepared for that. And so I relied on my musicality and I look back in those, when I listen to those old recordings, I think, wow, I really need to work on articulation more. And you know, it's, yeah. it's funny how it's two sides of a different coin, but I think your approach is more correct. Would you agree that it's probably wiser to err on the side of the music as opposed to the technique or is that, am I, am I splitting hairs here? Oh, no, I, I absolutely not. You know, there, it, Pablo Casal says technique is wonderful, but it has nothing to do with the music. It's, it's a means to the end. And, and uh, you know, all the technique in the world is useless if the musical soul isn't there. Mm -hmm. And one of the teaching techniques that I've used quite successfully is, is what James Jordan calls storying. Oh. And, and not just with young kids, but, you know, if, if this were a, you know, if you want to make this personal and you're saying this, if it's a beautiful slow piece and you want to say to somebody about whom you care, imagine you're playing it for that person. And all of a sudden, the music takes on an entirely different character because they're doing more than just reading those little black dots on a white page. Remember your first term of teaching? Learning all the skills that you don't get taught in music school? Managing a transitioning culture in your classroom? Finding out that you have to teach guitar this term? During those early years, we found out that leaning on a community of music educators was important, not only for building that knowledge in ourselves, but also maintaining enough sanity to serve the students right in front of us. Amused is a podcast centered around a community of music teachers. Between the four of us, we teach choir, band, orchestra, general, jazz, and marching band at the elementary through collegiate levels. We certainly don't have all the answers, but you're welcome to listen in while we try to find them. Join us while we work through the challenges of music teaching and celebrate the joy of bringing music making into the lives of young people. In each episode, you'll hear stories, both good and bad, about that week of teaching, and we'll try and tackle an issue that one of us is struggling with. Something we're all taught is that music brings people together, but being the only teacher in your subject at a site can be really isolating. We think everyone ought to be a part of a community, and you're welcome to come join ours. Episodes come out on Wednesdays during the school year, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and at amusedcast.org. All right, Paul, let's get on to these final questions. I, I, I think I've come up with a name after 190 interviews. I think instead of the lightning oh, round, I'm going to call it the enlightened round because they're slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you are the, you are the, the first enlightened round as far as the name of them. <laughs> okay. That sounds really good. I like that. So the first question I ask of everybody is where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? I, I think that, that when the competition becomes more important than the music itself 
and that becomes the modus operandi, then then you stepped way over the line. And the thing is, and that's one of the things that I, I was really proud about when I taught in high school, we got to the point where we didn't have to worry about making a first division when I went to our UIL. Mm-hmm. We knew that that was going to happen because the kids played well. So what we tried to do was make everybody in that audience and every judge feel the music. Mm-hmm. Sure. And again, get back to Bernstein, you know. When the conductor feels the music, the ensemble feels the music. When the ensemble feels the music, the audience feels the music. But it's got to be a, a circular thing. There's an intellectual aspect. The kids have to be taught to understand the music and not just play it. They have to be taught to feel the music. And then those two together, they have to be able to play technically well enough so that there's nothing that destroys the music. Yeah. You know, I, I had Greg Bim on the show and he talked about it. You know, he's had so much success mm-hmm. as a band director, seven national championships, all these things. And he was so humble about it. And he said, all that, all that trophy represents is one day where my kids played really well. Exactly. Yeah. So I thought that was a great way to think about it. Yeah. Well, and if you teach the kids, how do you feel when you finish playing? Mm-hmm. And if you teach the kids that it's not just that one day, but how do you feel about this section that we played in rehearsal today? Mm-hmm. And what can we do to make it better? But you just hit on something that, and and Greg is one of the many people whom I respect. And one of the reasons I do respect him is because there is that humility. Mm-hmm. No, he's very humble. And, and and that's why he's so good. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. He, he that's it was one of my favorite conversations. And you know, Bobby Lambert too, who was his assistant for many years. Absolutely. You know, it's it's cut from the same cloth. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it's not about them. Right, right. And they're going to keep on getting better because they don't think they've arrived. All right, Paula, this is a question that vexes many music teachers and um it's how did you find a work-life balance in your career as a music teacher? You know, I'm asked that a lot and I have to laugh because there <laughs> is there is no work life balance in my life. Sure. I I never married. Mm-hmm. So especially as a young teacher, I could spend as much time as I needed to spend, mm. you know, teaching and thinking about teaching and working with the kids. And um, you know, that that has worked for me. Yeah. I so admire people, especially women, who can have a family and raise children and and be wonderful productive teachers and there are mm. lots of them yeah but but my work-life balance has always been work yeah it's something it's it's why i like teaching fourth or eighth grade <laughs> i get to spend plenty of time with my kids well you know in a university band a position especially if you're doing the marching band in the fall is an 80 to 90 hour week especially in places like texas because we travel to almost every game and, you know, so that it, it's a very time intensive and, and very pressure filled situation. When you when you have a marching band that's out in front of one hundred and twenty thousand people. It better be prepared because it's not going to lose your job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, it's 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 a very pressure filled situation. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I didn't even really ask you about that aspect of your career, about what what it was like at the at the marching band director at Texas. I mean, that's a thing. Oh, yeah. And I love the practices. <laughs> and I love the halftime performances. And hook them horns. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had years where they were great teams, and that was terrific because the kids always are, you know, it, it's much better when the team wins. And interestingly enough, in my years there, the athletic director was a man named Lost Dodds who played euphonium in his Kansas high school band. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, really an outlier as far as band directors were concerned because I could go talk to DeLoss and he could understand what I was talking about. He would pretend he didn't sometime when I wanted more money for drum heads, but nonetheless, you know, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a good situation. But that, you know, there's, that's such a pressure-filled situation because there's so much money in college athletics. Yeah, especially at Texas. Oh, gosh, yes. And, you know, we just fired a coach that was a pretty darn good coach and going to pay him millions to go off into the sunset and paying millions and billions for another one. <laughs> it's And it's, it's gotten like that, too. 
very much. You know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate with the show, of course, to have talked to Pat Dunnigan and, and, you know, various directors yeah. around the country at big major programs, Randall Coleman, you know, various people. And oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I could have done that job had I, that been my path. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, you know, in every great college, you know, has a, a tradition mm -hmm. that really, you know, matters to a lot of people. And um, mm -hmm. so from that aspect, I mean, you know, I got to say, when you stand up at the end of a football game and do this and 80,000 people come to their feet, that's a pretty powerful feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, you know, if I had a choice between, you know, standing before 80,000 people or, you know, conducting the doll symphony, yeah, there's no choice. Uh huh. Yeah, well. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's there's no question of that. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, I just trying to imagine that that scene. <laughs> oh, it was, and the kids, you know, the the kids, and the, like I say, they're some of the best and brightest kids at the university. They catch on mm -hmm. so fast, especially my trombone section. I always used to laugh at those kids because for some reason, more engineers wind up playing trombone. I guess it's that proportion thing. I don't know. Right. But they'd always be if I if I weren't careful, they'd always be six sets ahead of the rest of the band. <laughs> We'd be learning a show. It's like trombones, slow down. We've got you know, we're still on chart four and you're on fifteen. Okay, so the next question I ask it's from your perspective and your experience, what are the challenges that we're facing in music education and band and, and how do we meet them? You know, I I see in in and many of my colleagues blaming the kids for uh, not caring as much as they used to. And, you know, I hear that all of the time. And, and you know, since, the, you know, in, in the digital age, their retention span and their attention spans are shortened. And I just read a study a couple months ago, a professor at USC, there's absolutely no scientific evidence to support the belief that the attention and retention span is any different than it's ever been. What we have to do is figure out how to communicate with those kids in their world. And that's how we go forward with music education. I, I think that, you know, music is music has been a part. There was a uh, you may have read. I read it in Scientific American. There was a, a bone flute that was discovered in a cave in France. And it was like. Four hundred thousand years. I don't know. It was like. A, I don't know how many years old, just hundreds of thousands of years old, which proves that music has been made since the dawn of man, and it's going to be with us. And 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 the key to the future of music education is to stay focused and alive and joyful about the process of music making and not get sucked into all of the negatives because the kids are going to emulate their teachers and they can spot a fake at 10,000 yards, but you know, if, and a lot of that has to do with the literature. If we choose literature that's good literature, that is, is, is solid, that it, the craft of the composer is such that you don't get tired of it after a week of rehearsal, then that's going to be music that speaks to kids. And that's something that they're going to take with them for the rest of their lives. And there's a, there's a poem that's it talks about the fact that sometimes, you know, music is is not only in the soul, but it exists in a place in the soul that nothing else can touch. And when we share that gift of music with kids, you know, you can't put a price on that. But the future of music education is, is as it always was. It's in the hands of the teachers. If we have fine teachers, and we do, if we have dedicated teachers, if we do, if we have passionate teachers, and we certainly do after this year, you know, music education is going to be alive and well. And if anybody says anything else, send them to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I get frustrated with the, the idea that our kids are somehow... Well, there's two two sort of competing things that I get frustrated with. One is that the kids somehow are worse than they've ever been. Every generation says that, and it's wrong every single time. Every in fact, time. the opposite is true. 
Yes. They're brighter. Yes. <laughs> you know, they're more articulate. They understand. I mean, they're certainly more worldly. Oh, yeah. I think to their detriment a little bit, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, well, worldly in a universal sense, not worldly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But, but again, you know, that it's, I think it's the, whether we're going to look at the world as the glass is half full or half empty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I refuse to believe that that glass is half empty. I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. The other thing is I was a little bit concerned about the future of large ensembles because of sort of like what's happening with the youth, like their attention is a little bit different. And we have to, we have to attend to that and make sure that we don't take that for granted. We have something special, but we do have to tend it like a garden. And that's a good analogy. And, and again, you know, if, if we're having trouble with attention span, the pace of rehearsal is not good. Well, that's a, that's a very true point. <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody that stops and has to spend five seconds figuring out what they're going to say, they've already lost the ensemble. Yeah, you may as well just keep conducting and figure it out on the way, <laughs> way there. I mean, every conductor's what? been in that situation where it's been like, okay, I have to say something because something's wrong, but what is it? You just keep going until you yeah. figure it out. <laughs> or stop and say, let's go back and play this again. What do you hear? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because that's the other piece of the puzzle. It, you know, the, the difference between the dictatorial band director and the person that says, what do you think about that phrase? That makes all the difference in the world. If the students feel like they're a part of the music and their opinions matter. And even with little beginners, I have never stopped and said, you know, the one exercise that I do with kids to, to make them more cognizant of, of the you know phrase shape is to say, I, we're going to play this again. I'm just going to start. And then I want you to stop on the note that you think is most important in this phrase. And, you know, with the advanced kids, sometimes they'll think it's a four bar phrase or an eight bar phrase. Or there'll be a difference of opinion, which is good. With little kids, you know, even go tell Aunt Rhody, they're going to figure out what they think is the most important note. And they'll start to do something with it if we do more than just spoon feed them. I, every rehearsal with my fourth and fifth graders, I ask one of them every day to come up and listen to the, their peers play and then offer their thoughts about what they heard. That's great. They're, they're brutally honest. Sometimes I have to like be like, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, they all look forward to it. I mean, as soon as we get to that moment and they know it's coming, they're all like with their hands up because they want to be the one to come up. Well, and you're teaching them to listen. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm teaching them that I don't have all of the answers, that they are part of this. Good. Because, Good. well, it's it goes back to the, the, the pedagogy of the oppressed, you know idea indeed you know we're, we're building on the knowledge that they already have they're not coming to us empty no no and well said i discovered once that it occurred to me that my percussion especially you know if we were playing a piece that didn't have really challenging percussion sometimes they would just zone out so once a week i put the percussion section behind me so oh. they were listening to the band because it occurred to me that they were always they never heard what i heard you know, don't you hear that? Well, no. <laughs> and, and I would stop and say, and I would give them copies of the score, and I'd stop and say, what are you hearing? And at first, they were all talking about rhythm and, and aligning the notes up in precision. But I'll never forget the day that one of the kids said, you know what? The trombones aren't phrasing that the same way the flutes are. And I remember, I can still hear the whole band going, whoa. But that kid is a really fine band director now. That's a breakthrough moment. It was. And, and you know, because the suddenly, and, and the more they did that, the more the kids, when the percussion started, and, you know, they would play, of course, too. But the more they did that, and the more the percussion would start talking about what they were hearing in terms of balance and phrasing and, and style and all of the things that I wanted them to listen to, the more the band wanted to please the percussion section, which was funny. So, Paula, my favorite question of the interview, if I had a time machine and I could take you back to the afternoon of your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? Don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> That's uh, I get that answer a lot, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was I was way too hard on myself, mm -hmm. as many young people are. And it took me a little while to, and I'm talking specifically about music, took me a little while 
to understand that it never was going to be perfect. And if I waited to have joy in music making until I could play something perfectly, I would never enjoy playing my horn. All right. So the next one is, if you had a choice, what would be the final piece of music you'd want to conduct? It would probably, it would be the Doll Sinfonietta. Doll Sinfonietta. Excellent. I think that's one of the most remarkable pieces. <laughs> all right, Paula. So we're all looking forward to Midwest. How can people reach out to, to how can people reach out if they want to contact you? My email, pcryder at austin.utexas.edu. Excellent. Paula, I appreciate your time so very much. Thank you. Hey, listen, anytime I can talk about something I love, it's a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. Of course.